Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to an episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. Do you follow the pack or challenge the status quo? Join Ted as he explores how to succeed by going against conventional wisdom. You'll hear leaders in technology and security tell stories about how they achieve their success by doing things differently. Knowledge is power. Now, more than ever. CrowdSec, the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at CrowdSec.net. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington, and with me here today is our special guest, Camille Moorhart. She is the Director of Security Initiatives in the Security Center of Excellence at Intel, and she co-hosts this super rad podcast called Cybersecurity Inside. Camille, I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, definitely. Same. So you are a person who's very good at helping get to the simplest part of an idea. And when you and I were chatting the other day, this idea really triggered for me and what you were talking about was this idea of how do we break down and communicate really complex concepts in terms that are simple. And that's one thing that you help guests of your podcast do really well. So I was wondering if you could maybe enlighten us on this idea, like how do we do that? How do we take these really complex terms? Because in security, it's so complicated. It's there's so much jargon. There's so much confusion. And what we're really trying to do is simplify things. So how do we do that? Yeah, well, I think good questions are part of it. And I think part of good questions are probably just not letting go. Uh, you know, I think sometimes in you know the tech world, or maybe even more so in the security world within tech, it's like the jargon ju just gets out of hand very quickly. And you know, it's not always easy to feel like you're not sounding smart. So people will sort of answer a question, and sometimes the answer comes with three other acronyms in it. You're not quite sure what those are, you know, or you're not quite sure how that changed in the last little bit of time. And so, you know, I think just kind of continuing to ask or just saying, well, you've got to back that up for me. I don't really understand, you know, the premise of your answer, or maybe just up level things. Sometimes you got to up level before you can, you know, dive down deeper. It's like, I really need to understand, you know, why we're even looking at, at scarcity in the digital world when something can be replicatable infinitely at zero cost in the digital world. So I've got to understand that before I can really understand what a non-fungible token is, you know, basically, which is human nature, creating the notion of scarcity. So I think it's just like up level, down level, sideways level, and never let go. <laughs> I like that. So it's almost like even if maybe you feel like you do understand, there's power in continually asking the same question from slightly different directions. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, I think that's it too. Like you're saying, it's kind of like if you look at everything sort of like a sphere, it's like you want to understand from, you know, 100,000 feet, then you want to, you know, zoom in, you might have a, a, a question that's like really about the mechanics of technically how it works, that's stopping you from the next angle. Then you want to understand, okay, if I'm sitting on the equator, does that look different than if I'm sitting on the pole? Like, what does it mean to different people? Or what does it mean in different use cases? Or what does it mean if I'm a big company versus a small company? or if I'm a consumer versus a CSP, like how do these things, you know, play together and can I understand sort of every aspect of them? And can I understand what's like, what's it that, what's the argument that you guys are dealing with right now in the field? You know, is it, are the top technical experts arguing over anything or does everybody pretty much agree? Uh, that's really fascinating. I learned this idea the other day as I've been studying about how to, you know, be a better communicator in the context of being a leader and, and managing people and things like this. And I learned the power of even once it seems like the conversation's over, then asking the one more question that's just, and what else? Because then people feel like, oh, well, I didn't answer fully yet. Even if in their mind, they're like, I already told you what the answer was. They now scramble to try to describe it again, maybe in a slightly different way. And something new comes out of this new way of answering. So what's your opinion on something like that? 
Actually, yeah, I totally agree, except my approach might be to actually just pause a little longer than necessary, because I think a lot of times, especially when people are, you know, they're like a fellow or a senior architect or, you know, they're very, very technical. They've probably got a PhD, maybe in more than one field, you know, they're writing technical papers or dealing with equations or code. I think sometimes there's a lot more always that they could talk about. And so they're trying to pick a path that that helps everybody kind of understand what's going on. If after they're done explaining a concept and you just kind of wait a couple beats, sometimes something will show up in their mind like, oh, you know what? This is a good analogy. Or, you know, they'll remember something like when they were describing it before. It's like, this really helped people when I thought of that. Or, you know, what's funny, you know, I, the other day, you know, and then, then you'll get this great story of something that, you know, problem they ran into or, you know, company that they discovered was doing something completely incorrectly or really innovatively on the other side, you know, and you kind of get that extra insight. It's like, there's this, um, if anybody can tell me what it is, I would be most grateful. Long time ago, I heard that there's a, a verb or a word in Spanish for the time after the dinner party, like after the meal, when everyone's sitting around and then they're all, you're all just talking, but dinner's over. There was some word or phrase for it that was like, that's when really, that's when you really get to know people and you really understand what's going on. So I kind of feel like if you can get to that atmosphere in the conversation, then it's much more intimate. You really kind of understand the way people are thinking about a problem. You're getting the wheels turning right now because I never heard that term that you're just describing, but I can very easily conceptualize what you're talking about. And I often think about that in the context of interviewing for hiring people. You know, we're talking right now about interviewing guests on your podcast or just trying to communicate ideas. But I often find that when you're interviewing people, you can get the prepared, like, I'm going to go on this interview and these are, I'm going to talk about these stories and these are my strengths. I'm going to make sure I get that. And people sometimes laugh at me at our organization when I describe it this way. And I'm like, yeah, we got to, we got to let people tell those things because we want to hear that, of course. But what I really want to know is what happens when they think the interview's over. Yeah. And now it's like, all right, now we're going to grab some lunch or go grab a drink or I'm just going to walk you out or whatever. That's when really the magic happens when you can, you really get the reality of the person coming out. It sounds like that's similar to what you're saying, right? Everyone's kind of like the, the prepared part of the conversation's over and now it's the magic part happens. Yeah, the best part of every interview is usually after the record button goes off, right? As I'm sure you well know. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you got to figure out how to get that part, eke it back into the interview, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So it's interesting what I'm hearing you say right now, because I asked you about what's the best way for us to communicate complex topics simply. And your answer is really fascinating to me because you did not give a communication technique, you gave questioning techniques. So what I'm hearing you say is that the best way to communicate ideas is through the way we ask questions. Is that a correct read? Okay. I guess I would say, I'm not trying to argue the Socratic method is the best way to communicate. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, not that it isn't, but I'm, I don't have an opinion on that. I think for me, and, and really kind of the genesis of one of the episode series we have within Cybersecurity Inside, which is called What That Means, which is the one that I, I host when I bring in top technical experts and I ask them, okay, define 3D printing. And then let's talk about what are the, what's, what are the conundrums around it? How does it intersect with security or trustworthiness? or privacy. Let's define homomorphic encryption. Let's define AI. Let's define federated learning. Let's look at some of these topics that are hard. The genesis of that was that Tom Garrison, who's VP in security and I are co-hosts on Cybersecurity Inside. And we'd have these guests. We'd have, you know, Congressman Will Hurd, who was in, you know, was representative of district in Texas, which was the largest southern border on the United States. So he was really looking at security from the perspective of, you know, cybersecurity, border security, and also artificial intelligence for the United States and what its policy should be. He wasn't like architecting security as, you know, a chip designer or a software designer. He was architecting, you know, how we bring in these kinds of technologies into like our government. And so we'll talk with, you know, an Olympic athlete who helps us understand how maybe this Olympic athlete is less concerned or cricket, you know, cricket bowler, less concerned with, you know, the time clocks at the Olympics being hacked 
because super secure, very, very hard, more concerned with like the shuttle schedule, because I've got to get to, you know, my day of competition on the shuttle. And if it's off, then I'm off, you know, so really looking at like understanding how we have to look at security holistically. Anyway, we have these people on and sometimes we have CISOs on, right? Or people who are really like looking at securing an enterprise or cloud service provider, something like that. And I was like, I want to understand what some of these terms are. Like, what is the cloud? You know, what we just kind of take it for granted. We say the cloud. Well, really, what is that? And I want to talk to, you know, a fellow or a senior architect who built it, you know, or super supercomputer, high, high performance computing, like who actually designed one? That's who I want to talk to. And so I would like get ready for these interviews on AI with somebody by going and finding somebody who writes algorithms for AI for industrial machinery that is used in, you know, auto, automobile manufacturing or something. I find that person who's literally writing the algorithm and then sit them down and say, what is it? And, you know, why does it matter? So I guess what I mean to come back to your specific question is find the right person who can answer it and then let them answer it by asking them the right kinds of questions. Because I think with people who are actually making the design decisions and code decisions and building these technologies, you know, they're so in it, right? And a lot of times, you know, they could answer anything about it. So you've got to help a little bit direct the conversation so that, you know, the answer is relevant to whoever you're talking to. They can talk just as easily to, you know, a CEO as they can to, you know, a co-developer who's writing the algorithm, you know, in the room next door. Yeah. And I found too that it's it's interesting keeping these types of people who are these extremely high performers who make these, you know, wonderful contributions in their own way to their corners of the world, but helping them like distill it down sometimes. <laughs> I had, I had this one guest one time in the pre-call, I basically said, you know, I want to ask you about this, this one thing that you did. Um, it's like very pinnacle achievement in your professional career. And I want you to, can you just tell us about that? Cause I think a lot of our listeners mm -hmm. are, are hoping to do what you did. So can you just tell us like the immediate part right before that? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. It was this. And he describes it in like, you know, 30 seconds or something. We get on the show. So I said, okay, so you did this really great pinnacle thing in your career. A lot of our listeners wanted, can you tell me that, tell me that story? And he's like, well, I guess it started when I was four years old and yeah. I'm like, oh no, oh, this is going to be a journey going on this story right now. And I kept having to be like, so the part, the part right before you did that thing, like, can you tell me about that part? But then he told the details of it and it was, it was exactly what you wanted. He's like, oh, well, I had this goal and this was my strategy to achieve the goal. And I did these things in order to do it. And here's how I built a team. And you're like, that's what people wanted to hear. That's great. So how do you, how do we deal with that when um, like you and I, we do this all the time, right? We're interviewing people. So we, we can figure out when someone's like kind of lost the thread a little bit, or they're meandering away from where you want them to go. Everyone who's listening, they interview people that they might be hiring, or maybe they're just building friendships or they're out networking, but they don't do what we do every day. What is the tip? How do we get people to get to the heart of the matter? I think you just keep driving toward the heart of the matter, you know, and I think sometimes when people maybe wander off on a tangent or something, I mean, sometimes there's a lot of insight in those tangents too. So I think like you say, you know, with your example, I think sometimes people just don't know what you're asking, you know, how far back you want me to start. I was born in, you know, <laughs> I was born in California. Okay. Well, that's too far back. I just wanted a little, but, but yeah, I think it's okay. I think that's the other thing too, is just relax. Like, in your interviews, it's very conversational and friendly. And that's the other nice thing I think about podcasts is generally they can be friendly. So you're really trying to understand how somebody's approaching their problem. And it's okay if it goes a little bit, you know, to the side, there's not like a specific time limit. You can come back around. Of course, there's always post-production editing, which is like a gift as needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too, how, I mean, really what is podcasting, right? It's, it's having conversations. And when I first started this, I will totally admit the the selfish motive is like I just wanted to learn from smart people and uh, I wanted to bring a problem that I had and say here's what I'm running into and you don't even you might not even realize this but you've been helping me with a problem I have right now which is like you know what's the right kind of questions and how do you get to the heart of it so yeah well I'm glad that you feel this is fun and conversational so that's good. <laughs> Well, it's the exact thing, like uh, same as same thing you're describing for yourself is what happened to me, right? I was like, well, I'm booking meetings with these people 
who are like most, I mean, honestly, most of the world doesn't really have access to them. It's not that they're, they wouldn't, you know, maybe talk to anybody, but how do you find out even who they are? Like who is literally writing the post quantum cryptography algorithms? How do you even know, you know, unless you're in the literature and you're looking at, you know, who's published and you realize, well, you know, some of these things, there's really only like a couple dozen people in the world who are actually, you know, doing the design on the product or on the technology technology might not even be a product. And so I realized like I was lucky enough to be able to reach out to a lot of these people. I was lucky enough to be able to book their time and sit down with them for my own edification. You know, I'm trying to understand how this works. You know, please help me understand really what is wireless. You know, I am trying to understand what is privacy. We talk about privacy all the time. What the hell is it? Is it the same everywhere? Does everybody have the same concept? I mean, I know it's different in different places, but do all humans have the same general concept? Do we have standards around the world? Like, you know, what, like, how do we even approach something that really we don't have a common definition for? So I get in the room and talk with people and then I'd leave and be like, how come nobody else got to hear that? You know, and so that was kind of where it was like, well, I'm just going to start recording, you know, come what may. And it's just been fantastic. Like you say to let, like, just kind of open it up so that more people can hear from experts. Totally. So I'd love to hear you maybe stitch together some of the things you've learned from some of these guests. So you presented this example of an Olympian. Right. And the question being, you know, should an Olympian be worried about someone hacking the timekeeping system? Because, you know, if you can change it by a hundredth of a second, you could change the outcome of the race. And the answer to that, as you described it, was no. That's, that's a, you know, obviously that's a direct way that someone might change the outcome of this race. But the more likely scenario would be, you know, could someone interrupt the athlete's preparation? And if you can interrupt their preparation, maybe the, you know, schedules of the shuttles are off. If their preparation is off, then maybe their performance is off. And what's really interesting to me about that story, the way you described it, is that that's the way that I'm always advocating for people to think about an attacker mindset, right? It's not always as linear as we think. It's more about like, how can we manipulate, you know, towards an outcome we're looking for. So when you've interviewed all these really smart people across security, you obviously have this important role in the security of excellence of a, you know, major tech company. What are the things that our audience could take away from what you've learned about how do we do that? How do we more effectively think like an attacker thinks? How do we look at the Olympic performance and say, it's not the timekeeping system, it's the shuttle schedule. Like, how do we apply that, think like an attacker mindset? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to answer by saying there's there's, I think there's two different kind of approaches. There's sort of the discipline of a lot of mature organizations around, you know, security practices. I'll say security, and I mean privacy, trustworthiness, safety, all of those things together. You know, there's secure development lifecycle. There's integrating it with your product development lifecycle. There's automating certain aspects of it so you're sure that you're checking for, you know, all of the known vulnerabilities that are out there. There's other kinds of practices, you know, threat modeling. There's bug bounty programs to try to pull in friendly hackers to help you find, you know, potential vulnerabilities. All kinds of security assurance processes. And and the what that means portion of cybersecurity inside, we actually go into, I'll talk with experts who like run SDL or run product security incident response, you know, at companies like Intel or Dell or, you know, various places where you can say, okay, this is kind of a mature approach to this practice that we should have probably. And it might vary. It probably scales up differently depending on the size of your company, but that's a good place to start with kind of practically speaking, how do you roll a bug bounty program out, you know, or something like that. On the other side, like you say, that's great to have all those practices, but unless you're looking at it from outside in or looking at it from, you know, the person who's just trying to possibly create a problem or have an upset or inadvertently do something like my son, the other day, we were staying at a hotel and he's like, what's the Wi-Fi password? So I told him, I said, oh, by the way, the network is the name of the hotel. He's nine years old. He said, Oh, whoops. I guess I'm in their camera system. I clicked on the Arlo network. I thought that was the one that I was supposed to use. And I used the password you said, and I'm in. I was like, okay, log out. <laughs> log out. <laughs> um, your son is awesome. <laughs> 
can your son come work for us? He's amazing. You know what I mean? So he wasn't trying. He was trying to get online. But, you know, the hotel had just used the same password for their security camera. So it's like, unless you're, you know, and so that's why I think a lot of it, we try to talk to people who aren't always just the people inside the security industry. Of course, we're looking for the intersection points of, you know, why do medical devices, why should we even consider medical devices in cybersecurity? Well, you know, you've got a lot of medical devices inside of people these days, right? And, and those devices never used to be connected to the internet, but now they are. They're maybe not connected to the broad internet that you do your, you know, searches on, but they're connected so that they can alert you, you know, via Wi-Fi, potentially if you're having a problem, say, or with your blood sugar level. So how do you do an update in that kind of a device? Well, now we've got so much of our critical infrastructure in space orbiting around us. Okay, how do you do an update in something like that? So we try to bring in that like external perspective to just remind us. I'll tell you, when we had the Olympic athlete on, I did not expect that he was going to say the shuttles were the thing that made him the most worried about. And the other thing I didn't expect is he was talking about, you know, we were kind of approaching it like you must really worry about like all of the data that's collected on you personally, you know, all of your, you know, your blood work and all this stuff that's very, very private medical data. He's like, no, I, I'm pretty much a product, you know, at this point, like my performance is pretty much, you know, out there. It's kind of like, that is my, that is my product. So that doesn't worry me so much. What other things worry me? So I think unless you talk with people, you know, you don't really, you can form all kinds of opinions or hypotheses, but unless you understand really what's concerning them, you don't really know what problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, I agree. I, I would not have originally thought the shuttle problem <laughs> would be one, but I think anyone who has any sort of travel anxiety about flying or things, they're like, I totally get the shuttle problem. That, <laughs> that's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How am I going to show up for my meeting if the plane is late? It's horrible, you know, even mentally. <laughs> right, right. Oh, what if the security lines are long today? Yeah, there's, there's an endless supply of those points where a, a process can break down and where, where the for an Olympian where preparation must require, must uh, follow really a certain process step-by-step. Step. Yeah, that that's significant. Well, that's pretty cool. So as we sort of come to wrap up our time here and you think about all the smart things that you've learned from all these smart people through the course of your podcast and of course, through the security initiative, the center of excellence that you're involved with, what would you say for our audience who's, you know, people who are building secure systems, trying to keep them secure, what's the number one or a couple things that are the most important that you've learned for how to do that well? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to kind of the conversation we just had, which is, I would say, you know, look for practices, mature practices and, you know, policies and governance and security assurance. And there's lots of help out there, right? Online and through classes and whatnot. I would say, you know, apply those and figure out the right space for yourself. I would say start is the one thing I hear from lots of people who are really expert in the area and in the field. They say, you know, don't let all of it intimidate you. Start somewhere, do something. Somebody told me once, start with just like a website or an email address that allows somebody who finds a vulnerability in your product to let you know about it. You know, just start with that at least. So if there's somebody out there who finds a problem, they could tell you, you know, there's lots of sophisticated processes for you know, mitigating those kinds of things, communicating those kinds of things, coordinated vulnerability disclosures, but at least start somewhere. And then the other side of it is really, I would say, don't ever stop talking to people who are doing things you're interested in, but they're not coming at it from that security angle. So they're coming at it from like, as we were saying, like, a, you know, high performance athlete or maybe a social media influencer. They're going to have their own concerns about privacy and security that are different, you know, than somebody who's running an IT department. So I think always making sure that you're talking with, you know, I'll say end users as well as customers, as well as just people that you might even even think are sort of on the periphery, but they're going to give you this insight into, you know, what kinds of concerns are on the horizon for you. You know, the things they're worried about that you're not thinking about yet, or you had not thought about in that way, right? It will help you, I think, you know, design the product the best you can. If you kind of have an intersection of those two things. I love it. So to summarize, I think I heard, I heard a three-step process that was oh, just outlined here. Number one, <laughs> get started. Number two, don't stop learning. And number three, learn from outside of your sphere that you're already in. 
yeah, that's pretty good. Thank you. I hadn't put that together in my head. I appreciate you distilling it for me. <laughs> there we have it. Now I know what's going in the show notes. It can be your next book. Yeah, it'd be good, good to go. <laughs> So cool. Well, Camille, you're, you're awesome. Thank you so much for sharing some ideas and insights with us here today. Is there any last parting words you want to leave with our audience before we go? Well, I'll say definitely check out Cybersecurity Inside. If we manage to make it to top 10% of all public podcast listens with a name like Cybersecurity Inside, then you know it must be halfway decent, right? And some of the sub episodes within that are what that means with Camille, where, which are the ones we're working with the technical experts on very specific topics and defining them. So give us a look and see what you think. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm already going to be doing that. That's for sure. So <laughs> Camille, thanks for spending time with us today. And for everybody listening, if you want to learn more about what Camille's up to or request to appear on the podcast yourself, just go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we'll catch you next time. CrowdSec, the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at crowdsec.net. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.